talk about today is the evolution of Elixir and the evolution of the Elixir language um, and the community, how it evolved, uh, how the language evolved for the community, how they adapted to each other um, and all these kind of things. Um, so I've been thinking about this for my whole Elixir life and I think it's a really interesting, now that Elixir is young but it's not very, very young anymore, it's like seven or six years old. Uh, and I think it's nice to um, look back at what happened and how the language changed and the community changed. Uh, so Erna Berto said, my name is Andrea, that's my handle on the internet. Um, I am a member of the Elixir core team and I have been for two and a half years. I joined around 2016, uh, mid 2016, but I started working with Elixir a little bit earlier. So I started around the end of 2014. Um, so I've been, uh, Elixir was started in 2011, just to get, get an idea. So I've been there for a little bit more than a half of Elixir's life, and I've been in the core team for half than that. Um, so I don't have a very full, full picture, uh, because I joined a little bit late, but uh, it's uh, from 2014 and on, I have a pretty good picture of what happened. Um, so what I do is I am a software developer. I speak at a lot of conferences. This is to prove you that I conference as with uh, at all conferences. Um, this one I really like because I'm not there, but Norberto is here. <laughs> First line, uh, this was in Amsterdam, and I asked everyone, can you please dab? And he's the only one that didn't. Look at that. So uh, that was terrible. Uh, and it's front row. Anyways, um, so I work, I work at a company called Widmaps. Um, so do you know what Yelp is? Yelp? So Widmaps is like Yelp, but for weed. So you can buy uh, weed online. There's, there's a website, you can go there and you can see reviews of like marijuana strains and marijuana dispensaries. And this is where it's legal for re recreational medical uses. And my favorite feature that we have is online order. I don't know if you can see it there, but you can get basically like Uber Eats kind of thing. You can get weed delivered to your house. Um, and my favorite option about that is that there's a, an option where the driver stops at the road, uh, sorry, at the street corner, um, and you go in there in the car and you give him the money and he gives you the weed so that it doesn't go. So it's kind of like a drug deal option to get the weed delivered to your house, uh, which is really nice. If you're interested in this, we are hiring Elixir engineers and there is no weed involved. So you, you should just, well, you would come and work with Elixir, not with weed. Um, let's start with a timeline like a short timeline of Elixir just to put it into context and just to see how, when he was born, what was happening and what happened after he was born. Um, so let's start with, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm going to talk you through it. Uh, but the um, first thing that happened is um, Erlang in 19... Can you see this? It's fine? Yeah. Um, so the first thing that happened, let's uh, say 1988, Erlang is conceived. So it would take a few more years for it to be in production and used. Uh, but in 1988, that's when Joe Armstrong kind of um, invented the language. Um, after a few years, in 1993, Ruby was conceived. So same thing, it would take a little bit for it to um, become public and become like an actual language, but that's when it was started in 1993. And this kind of surprised me because they're really, really close. It feels like Erlang is 100 years old um, and Ruby is not, but they're really, really close in age. In 2001, and, and Ruby is interesting for us uh, because uh, a, a lot of Elixir came from the Ruby community, right? So the inventor of Elixir, Jose, was a member of, like a prominent member of the Ruby community. And um, he was a member of the Rails core, core team. And he, when he wrote Elixir, a lot of people moved from Ruby to Elixir. So Ruby plays a pretty important role in the history of Elixir. Um, and in 2000, 2001, when programming Ruby comes out, that's really when Ruby explodes um, because it gets uh, known in the, in the whole world, thanks to this book, basically. 2004, that's when Rails comes out. Um, and again, this is important for us because that's where Jose got his kind of big open source um, contributions because he was a member of the Rails core team. Um, and Rails was really important because it drove a lot of people to Ruby for web development. And we will see that this influenced Elixir as well because a lot of people moved from Ruby to Elixir to do web development, especially in the earlier days. Um, 2007, just to give you an idea, that's when Clojure gets invented. Um, Clojure gives a lot of influence to Elixir as well. So I think it's, it's interesting to see where it, where it, when it was born, where it is in the timeline. Um, in 2010, uh, a book's com book comes out called Seven Languages in Seven Weeks. Um, and 
at this point in time, Jose was in the in the Rails core team, and he was trying to add threads to make Rails threads safe, and he was getting very frustrated with this um, because it was hard and it was not friendly. So he said, like, he wanted to set out to make something better that would um, work concurrently and, and all these kind of things in a better way. And he came across this book, he read this book, and Erlang was mentioned, was one of the seven languages in this book, right? So he got interested in Erlang, um, and the famous quote that he, that he says is that he loved all the things that he saw, but he hated what he didn't see, right? So he, he loved all the nice features of Erlang, but he saw a lot of gaps in how Erlang was used, in the tooling, in the community maybe. Um, so he set out to build a new language that would kind of fill, fill in those gaps. They would take everything good from Erlang, but would also try to make everything that Erlang didn't have um, good in this new language. So in 2011, that's when the first Elixir commit, um, the, the first Elixir commit happens. So in 2011, the history of Elixir starts, um, and this starts with the first commit, um, then development keeps going for a little while, it's experimental at first, then it starts to be a language that kind of makes sense. Uh, in June of 2013, Ecto uh, is started, and we will see later that Ecto is kind of the first, one of the first big libraries for Elixir, and we will see later that, it, that I think it plays a really important role in the history of Elixir. In January 2014, Phoenix, the first commit to Phoenix is made, uh, and that's a really, really important Elixir library as well, we will see later. In July 2014, I'll figure later, the first Elixir conf happens in Austin, Texas. And this kind of, the first Elixir conference can, kind of shows that this is a real language, right? There's a, there's a conference about it, so there's, it's not just a few people interested in it, it's more than a few people, right? So this is a really a, important milestone, I think, in, the, in Elixir's history. In September 2014, just a few months later, Elixir 1.0 comes out. Um, and I remember I joined Elixir, I got interested in Elixir before 1.0, but I left it out and I didn't care about it because I was getting frustrated with how many changes there were that, that were happening, right? So a lot of changes were happening, documentation was not always up to date, so I got really frustrated. This is where I joined again on 1.0 because the language actually felt stable now. At 1.0 it felt like it was a real language, it was stable. Um, so it's a big, really big milestone because now the language is, like we're, the team is declaring that the language is production ready, basically, right? Um, and just the, night, the month after that, Programming Elixir, Elixir comes out, and that's the first book about Elixir. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, now the landscape of Elixir is looking really good because the language has a conference just for the language. The language has a book to learn the language. So it's learning resources, community events. Uh, it reached 1.0, so it's production ready. It has a web framework, it has a database uh, layer library. So I think this is where Elixir really starts to look very viable to use, right? So that's a, his, and then we have from 2014 to now uh, where the language evolved and it, it became, became more stable, that's what we're gonna talk about, basically. So let's talk about how the language evolved, right? And the first thing that I wanna talk about is what are the pillars of a language? What are the things the language needs in order to thrive and to exist and to evolve and to grow? Um, so the thing that is, things that a successful language needs, I think, are a good team. So the team is fundamental for the language. Um, it, the community is fundamental for the language. Uh, and the ecosystem is very important as well. Uh, and a successful language has to have all three of these, right? Um, and let's go, let's have a look at why these three are important. So the first one, the team, um, I think it's really important, and the team takes a few roles. Um, those roles, I think, are coordination of the uh, like language and the community. So the one thing that the team does is coordinate the direction of the language, coordinate the community on how to work with the language, um, coordinate uh, the changes that go into the language versus the changes that don't go into the language, so they're kind of the guardians of the language, right? Um, another thing that they do is quality assurance, so QA for the language. So everything that goes into Elixir, the team is reviewing, right? It, nothing goes in, in Elixir without the team having looked at it. Um, so they kind of do the work of ensuring that the code is up to standard for the Elixir code base, ensuring that this is something we want, that it works correctly as we expect. So they kind of do work of QA because of their experience in the language. Um, and then, of course, they're, they're taking care of ma maintenance. So they're taking care of 
uh, like they're, they're the ones that committed to maintaining the language. So if there's a bug, they're the ones that committed to fixing it. Or it, like me, if you want Elixir to have a long life, they're the ones that committed to being there for, for the language's life. So the team has a pretty important role. The community, though, a team without a community is not like the, the language doesn't really exist, right? I, I can't invent the language myself, and I'm the team. But if there's no community, what's the point, right? So the community is really important. Um, and I think it takes the roles, um, first of all, of experimentation. So one really important thing that the community does is experiment with the language, is push the language to new frontiers, is, it tries to explore what's possible uh, with the language, it tries to bend the language in ways that it wasn't meant to be bent. Um, and an example I can give you is nerves, right? So nerves happened because the community made it happen. We didn't have nothing to do with it. So um, they're definitely responsible for this kind of experimentation and playing with the language, which ultimately drives the language forward. They're also responsible for the third pillar of a language, which is the ecosystem. So the community is what takes care of the ecosystem, of the libraries around the language, of the learning resources around the language, of the community events. And a language without these things is not really, it, it, it has a hard time being used a lot, right? Because people need libraries that do stuff because they don't want to write everything themselves or people want the resources to learn a language and, and, um, and so on. So it's really important, the, the, the ecosystem. And the ecosystem really is in the hands of the community, right? Um, and then the third thing, of course, is using the language. So the community is responsible for using the language. If we don't have a community that uses the language, we don't really have a, a language. All right, so one thing that I've been asking myself is, uh, as during the years that I've been with Elixir, so I know that Elixir grew to reach 1.0, because it reached 1.0, uh, but after that, uh, did it keep growing? So is it still growing? Um, and it's really hard to gather data on this. It's really hard to say to have objective data that say that Elixir has been growing. My feeling is that it definitely has been growing because you see more questions, you see more people at events, you see more um, applications using Elixir, you see more libraries for Elixir. So there's definitely a feeling that the community and the language are growing. Um, but some, that some of the data we can look at, um, this is the commit, sorry, the new contributors graph for Elixir. Uh, and I know it's not representative because a very small percentage of people in the Elixir community contribute directly to the Elixir language. Uh, but it's still interesting to see that from 2011 to 2017, the number of unique contributors per year kept growing. So like in 2012, we had fifth, like around 50 new contributors. In 2015, we have 100, 160 new contributors. Right? So every year, the number of contributors grows. And I think that that's really interesting because it's, it shows that I mean, it must show in some way that people are, are there's more people working with Elixir, right? Because there are more people that are willing to contribute to the language. And so this year is a little bit less contributors, uh, so the year is not over yet. And uh, I mean, we, we will talk about why I think that is later. Another thing that can kind of show that the community is growing is the community events throughout the years. So we said that in 2014, we only had one conference, one Elixir conference over there, right? Elixir Conf in Austin. Um, if you look at the evolution of these, 2015, there's now three conferences. 2016, there's now like six conferences, and then they keep growing and they keep spreading out all over the world. And I think this is a pretty representative it's a pretty representative um, data that shows that the community has been growing because if there's more people that are willing to go to conferences and there's more people willing to organize conferences and speak at conferences, it means that there's more people interested in Elixir some somehow, right? Um, so that's really interesting, I think. Um, now, what are some things in the 20, uh, in, sorry, in the, from 2014 to 2018, in the five years that Elixir has has been 1.0 and over, what are some things that we got better at? Um, <clears throat> the first one that's really interesting to me is porting libraries. So in the early days of Elixir, I don't know how many of you, how many of you used Elixir in 2014? There you go, one. In 2015? One. 2016? 2017? All right, 2018? Okay, 2019? I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> but, uh, so, so not a lot of people from the early days of Elixir, but in the early days of Elixir, something that happened is that people tend, tended to 
port libraries a lot. So they would take libraries from other languages and port them to Elixir. And when I say other languages, I mostly mean Ruby. Like it was mostly happening with Ruby, right? And this, so this is what was happening. Like port a lot of libraries to Ruby, uh, from Ruby or other languages to Elixir. And it was a little bit of a problem because often the libraries were ported straight away. Like they were just copied from, from something like Ruby to Elixir, which h hardly makes sense because the, the, like, the ideas behind the two languages are very different. Like one is a functional language, one is an object-oriented language. Uh, so the, the, the point is that the libraries were not designed for Elixir. They were just ported out to Elixir, right? which, which was a problem. And I think we got really a lot better at this because right now there's a lot of l ideas that, that, um, that are born in the Elixir community and a lot of libraries that are um, born in the Elixir community as ideas. So we now got a lot better at creating libraries for Elixir and then take advantage of Elixir strength and they use Elixir patterns and everything like that. And if we're porting libraries, we kind of got better at redesigning them for the language, right? So that's one thing. Another thing that I, s that I saw um, evolving is the perception of Elixir. So in the early days, Elixir was really often perceived as Ruby on steroids, right? So you would see it's something like this, like there's, yes, there's a small Erlang component, but it's mostly like just Ruby, but functional, right? Um, and that's, that was a pretty weird way of looking at it. And like you would see Elixir evangelized that Ruby conferences like this, um, and it was like, this is how it was seen, right? And I think throughout the years, we re and, and in this time, like OTP wasn't a thing, like people from Elixir really, really were really scared, I think, or like didn't really have any interest in OTP. They wanted to write their kind of their Ruby, but in Elixir, right? They're, they were interested in things like metaprogramming because you can do macros and you can do DSLs and this kind of stuff. But OTP, like they didn't think about this too much. Like they wanted to see it as like the smallest possible amount. Um, and I think this changed in the community. We realized that Elixir is like 90% Erlang, right? Like all the good things in Elixir come from, most of the good things at least, come from Erlang. And I mean, there is a little bit of a Ruby influence, yes, but there's Clojure influences, Lisp influence as well. Like it's, the language is influenced by other languages, but mostly it's still Erlang, right? The, the, the good thing about Elixir is still Erlang. And it adds a bunch of things on top, like metaprogramming or protocols or structs, a bunch of features on top of that, but it really, the core is Erlang and OTP. And we learned that OTP is a really, really important component of the Erlang um, and Elixir ecosystem, right? We learned, so the Elixir community started discussing um, like supervisors, discussing design of OTP applications, um, started thinking about how processing processes interact, about guarantees, about a lot of stuff that was previously kind of ignored by the community because they wanted to something have something more simple, I think. So that's really, really interesting. I think it, it, the community grew a lot um, in, the, in this aspect. Another thing that I, like really, really interested me so much is the pipe. So if you were there, I think just you were there when this was a phenomenon, but the pipe was like the Elixir feature. So people would go to conferences and would, they would evangelize um, Elixir. And one of the first thing that it was is that there's a pipe operator. Like, look at this language. It's amazing. We have a pipe operator or you can do like pipelines of data. And also you have metaprogramming and you have processes and all this stuff, but the pipe operator like it's so good, uh, and it's weird because this is just like an operator. It's pretty simple. Like you could have a language without. The, like most languages don't have this and are fine, right? Uh, but this, for some reason, it was such a big deal. And people wrote libraries that would make things to make things pipeable. Like there was a focus on making things pipeable so they would play nice with pipelines. Um, and there was a lot of proposals in the um, uh, mailing list that said like, how can we make the pipe more powerful? How can we make, make it pipe to the right? How can we make it pipe to the last argument? How can we make, 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 it, make it pipe to a random argument upside down, like inverted colors, uh, like everything. They proposed everything for the pipe. Um, now we kind of learned throughout the years that they're like, sure, the pipe is cool, but like it's just an operator, right? Like you can write your own, it's pretty simple. It doesn't really like, it's, it's nice, but it's nice to have. So we use it when, when it makes sense, but kind of lost interest. I don't see talks that evangelize Elixir mentioning the pipe anymore. I'm really glad of that because it's, it's a nice feature, but it's really like a, like a shrug feature. Um, another thing that I, from the Elixir team perspective, changed in the community, I think, which is really interesting, is the change in learning resources. 
So um, in their f first years of Elixir and after 1.0, we really had a lot of control over the learning resources for the language. So there was the getting started guide on the Elixir website, and that was the thing that we would point people to. We would say, if you want to learn Elixir, go there. Uh, if you want to get started, go there. And we controlled that. The Elixir team w were the ones that controlled um, that resource. And now throughout the years, we've seen a lot more resources pop up. So we've seen translations of things. We've, we've seen resources in in, from scratch, from another, other languages, uh, we've seen resources catered to particular people like object-oriented programmers or data scientists. Um, so there's a lot of more resources, and this means that we kind of lost control of how people learn Elixir, which was really interesting for us because now we, we have people coming to Elixir and saying, no, I've learned this from a tutorial for Fortran programmers, I don't know, and we don't have control um, over that anymore, which is good because it means the community is growing, right? But it's a little bit scary for us because we, because there's people learning in ways that we didn't anticipate, right? So we don't have a kind of a common ground where we, where we can say, yeah, so you, you know how this getting start guide, guide says this? Um, we can't do that anymore, basically. So those are some things that changed for the language, regarding the language. Um, but I want to look now at some significant events that really shaped the direction the language was taking and really shaped the growth of the language. Um, the first one I mentioned earlier is Ecto. So when Ecto came out, Ecto was kind of the big first library for Elixir, and it was a database abstraction layer, basically, right? Uh, but I think Ecto played a really, really important role beyond being just a database layer. So the first thing that I, when I think about Ecto, comes to mind is that it really, oops, it really changed, um, it really showed a new way to do things for Elixir. So as I said, a lot of the time people were porting libraries at the time, right? They were just taking libraries from other languages like Ruby and porting them to Elixir. And Ruby, which was very, a lot of, a lot of the community came from Ruby, Ruby had active record, right? Which is there database um, abstraction layer, and now we kind of know that Active Records does some things in maybe not the best way. Um, there's a lot of magic going on, there's a lot of coupling between data and behavior, for example. Uh, the, the callbacks are a little bit uh, weird to work with. So uh, it's really interesting that Ecto took a pretty different approach. So they, they took inspiration from other things, like um, Link, I think, from uh, for the um, query macros, uh, and it took inspiration from other things and not from Active Record to show that like we wanted to do things right in Elixir and for Elixir, right? We didn't want to just say, okay, Active Record sounds like a good idea, let's just do the exact the same for Elixir, right? It show, showed that you, for Elixir, you needed to think about things in Elixir terms, and you need to do things f specifically for Elixir in order to um, have good results with them. Uh, another thing that it showed is something that's really important in Elixir. So it showed that when you have something, you really want to try to separate data and pure code into their own thing and then have other parts of the, like isolate um, mutability as much as possible, right? So Vector is really just data, like the schemas are just data, they're not object. They're just pieces of data without behavior. And then you have functions or that operate on the data. And most of those functions are pure code, meaning that they don't have any side effects. They just change the data and return other data. They're just pure functions, oh, which, I mean, it's easy to test. It has a bunch of benefits, right? It, it's easier to reason about. Um, and then you have the repo in Ecto, which is where the um, side effects happen, right? Where the interaction with the database happen. And that's isolated to its own thing. So it, it was a really important step, I think, in showing how to architect a good Elixir library, a good Elixir interface, so having mostly data and pure code, and then have like isolate side effects as much as, much as possible. Uh, and I think it showed that really well. Another really, really important thing that Ecto did was to validate metaprogramming in Elixir. So when Ecto was, started, was being developed, Elixir was not 1.0 yet. Um, it was pre-1.0. So we had the metaprogramming, we had the macros, but we weren't sure that they were a very, that it were a powerful interface, and we, were, we weren't sure that they were enough to extend the language in powerful ways, right? And, and Exo kind of validated this and kind of demonstrated that, yes, like the macros were enough to make something, like the language was mature enough to be extended in very powerful ways without having to change anything in the language. So it, it also showed 
uh, as a consequence of this, it also showed the power of metaprogramming, right? It showed that you could do a very powerful query language in that case, just with the macro, just with the functionality that was in Elixir and with the macros in Elixir. Um, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, but we will slightly regret. Um, I'll talk about this now. We will slightly regret at some point that uh, all the metaprogramming because for the first years of the Elixir community, metaprogramming was a big thing, right? People were people were still saying, like, write macros, but try to write them uh, as little as possible, but they were not doing that. Like, they were running macros for everything, and the cells for everything, and I think this changed. It's like we will regret that this, that, like, Ecto showed how powerful metaprogramming is because people overused it, I think. They abused metaprogramming. And now we kind of are to a point where where we learn to dose the metaprogramming. So we learned that the best thing you can have is a non, this is like a functional interface for most of your things, like data functions, um, and then maybe have a macro layer on top of that that kind of um, makes it easier to work with your functions and data. But we kind of accepted that this is, like the metaprogramming is really just for some things, and it's really important to dose it very well. So Ecto has a, had a huge impact on the Elixir growth and Elixir development and Elixir evolution, I think, um, and the Elixir community as well. Another thing that, of course, comes to mind is Phoenix. So Phoenix is the web framework for Elixir. Um, it, it was necessary at the time to have a web framework for Elixir, right? because a lot of people were coming in from Ruby and Ruby on Rails, so a lot of people were web developers. So we really needed to have a web framework. Um, and the nice thing was that Phoenix hooked users um, and, they, and it drove them to Elixir through a web framework, which was in many ways similar to Rails, especially, right? So they, people felt comfortable working with Phoenix, and they learned Elixir through working with Phoenix because they wanted to work with Phoenix. And the other really important thing that it did was that it introduced channels, right? And, and Rails at the time didn't have anything like channels. Um, and if you don't know what channels is, are, is like, they're the way to interact with WebSockets and do real-time uh, stuff with, with Phoenix. And channels are a really good abstraction. And the nice thing is that this was a time when people wanted to really build connected web applications or real-time web applications. And so this, this came really at the exact right time. And it kind of attracted people that were not interested in changing languages. Like it attracted some people that were web developers, not interested in changing languages, but now they became interested because we had this nice, really nice way of working with real-time uh, communication between clients and servers, right? So I think this is a, like it drove a lot of people to the language and having a web framework meant that like the language was, having a web framework and a database layer meant the language could be used for a lot of web, web apps that people were writing in other languages. Um, a few years later, Nerves comes out, and I think this does, like it, it shakes the community a little bit because the Elixir community was like really into web development, right? So like the idea was, uh, sorry, so the idea was like, is, is Elixir ju is just for the web, right? But then Nerves comes out, and it shows that Elixir is not just for the web, that it can do a lot more. It can do embedded devices in these cases, right? And this is a kind of a snowball effect because after Nerves comes out, people start playing with Elixir in other fields, like they start playing with Elixir in data science. Uh, now we have a UI framework called Scenic for building UIs with Elixir, so people kind of realized that Elixir can do a lot more than web. It's general purpose programming language, right? Um, but before Nerves, that, like most of the things you would do were um, web-related, and I asked this to a few members of the core team as well, and they said, where um, where is a place that you didn't expect Elixir to go, but that it went to? Uh, and they all said nerves. They all said, I would expect that this would be a web language mostly. Um, so nerves kind of changed those things up a little bit. Um, and I know that Erlang people um, knew this already, that, that Erlang and OTP were good in embedded devices. And I think like Telecom, uh, where Erlang was born, like we, you had telephone switches and stuff like that. They're kind of embedded devices, right? They kind of work the way we uh, we want Elixir to work with work with nerves now. Uh, but the Elixir community definitely did not know that, so it's pretty um, pretty nice that that, it, that we were introduced to this. Basically, um, now when I look at some key growth factors 
for Elixir. So some things that the language provided, they really, I think, are key to how the language grew and to how the language um, evolved and attracted more people in. The first is document, the documentation. So documentation and learning resources are a really important thing for a language because if you don't have, don't have documentation, it's really hard to use the language. If you have good documentation, on the other hand, it's kind of easier to use the language, right? And it's kind of more pleasant to use the language. Um, so Elixir has a lot of these features, like it has um, built-in documentation, support for documentation, so you can have module attributes with the documentation for functions and types and modules and everything like that. It has officially supported tools to turn this metadata into actual documentation. So for example, there's xdoc, which turns into web, um, like HTML-based documentation, and there's uh, xdocs, which hosts the documentation. So it's really easy to navigate documentation and to, con and to look up documentation for things. Um, we also have support for documentation in the shell, and this is very friendly to the developers because they just have to have their own um, in development environment and they can just in in IEX they can go and look up documentation for things so it's really really important to have documentation and the, the quality of the documentation of Elixir is really high which makes it for a really pleasant experience to use because things are documented well so you know what to do with them right that that's really important another thing that I think was key to the success of Elixir is it ties in with uh, documentation a bit and the way you consume documentation, but it's tooling a user interface. So Elixir has really, really good tooling. Um, it has a lot of, I, really, I like to call this the, like the focus on developer happiness, um, but I think we are, the Elixir language is very focused on developer happiness. So it's very focused on making, the language is focused on making itself usable and pleasant to use and fun to use, right? So. This is, an, this is just a list of some of the things that we added to the language that really don't improve the language in any way for the language. They improve it for the developer, right? So if you look at, for example, the formatter, like the language was fine without the formatter, but developers are happier if the formatter is there and it formats their code and it makes their code consistent. Or same thing for syntax highlighting in IX, like, what's, like, it doesn't add anything to the language, but it adds to the developer's life, right? Because now the developer is working, and they have syntax lighting, and it's nice, and it's more pleasant to use than if these things weren't there. So it's really nice, and we put a lot of effort in this stuff, um, and I think it pays off, because this was one of the key things, I think, um, that made Elixir used, because people were, had just had fun using it, and it was a pleasant experience using it. Um, and the third thing, that I think is a key factor in how Elixir um, evolved and grew is the community. So Elixir's community, I mean, I'm, I'm biased because I'm, I'm in the Elixir community. Uh, you probably are biased because a lot of you will be in the Elixir community as well. But the Elixir community, I feel it's a bit, it's a bit special. It's a very friendly community. It's a very welcoming communi community. There's a lot of uh, friendly people that are um, it's very available and they're very welcoming to newcomers um, and this really makes the language pleasant to to work with because if you join a community that feel, makes you feel welcome you want to be there right and you can see this in community events as well there's a lot a lot of meetups a lot of community events um, there's and when you go to conferences you, you you can see that people go to conferences just to meet their friends it's like a very very wholesome and warm community right uh, and it's a pleasure to be in the community so people will stay in, with the language because of the com partly because of the community because they're happy working with the people they work with uh, and then maybe they met through the community and they're happy being in a, just a welcoming community so i think that's really important and i think we have to thank the creator of the language Jose, a little bit for this because he definitely set out an example on being warm and being welcoming and being friendly. Um, so we, I think a lot of people in the community just follow this example and that created for a very, um, very safe and welcoming um, community and a pleasant community to be in. All right, so what is next for Elixir? What are the, some things that are, will be evolving? What are some things that are changing? and that will be changing in the future. Um, the first thing that I can tell you is what the team will focus on, what the Elixir team will focus on. Um, and I think most of our work will be, <coughs> sorry, in these three areas. So maintenance, research, and developer happiness. So maintenance just means that we will keep being focused on making the language stable, keeping the language stable, keeping it, like fixing bugs, all the kind of things that are related to maintaining the language. Um, 
So that's going to be a, a really important part, and that's been an important part of the team of the work that team does for the whole life of Elixir. But it's definitely going to keep keep being a focus. Um, the other one, I'm sorry, the other one is research. So we're interested in doing research that would improve Elixir significantly, or in like disruptive ways, maybe. So an example of this is um, of research is Jose um, working on the type system for Elixir for the last uh, for 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 a few months. Uh, at some point, which didn't turn out to work very well, so we kind of abandoned the project. But this is what the kind of things we're interested in researching, right? Things that would change the Elixir language quite a lot, um, and th that they require a lot of work up front, though, to to do research and try to experiment with things that we can do. So this is part of the things that we can do. And the third thing thing is developer happiness. So I think we are going at least for me. I'm trying to keep focusing, um, and I'm going to keep focusing on making the language pleasant to use and making developers that use the language happy that they're using this language. <coughs> so before the conference, a few days ago, I put out a poll on Twitter asking the Elixir community, what do you think the team and the language should focus on in the future? What do you expect them to focus on, right? And the answer that I had were developer happiness, performance, stability, or innovation. So four, four options. And to my surprise, like almost half of the people replied developer happiness. So this is crazy when you think that things like performance are there. So people are always talking about performance, like things should be fast, things should go fast, uh, or stability, like th things shouldn't break. And I mean, of course, this, this is just what we should focus on the most. So we will focus on all of them, of course. But it's so interesting to see that people are so attached to a language that makes them happy, right? To a language that is fun to use. Um, and over things like performance and stability, like they want, like performance and stability are fine, but make the language like pleasant to use. I think that's like, the, that blew my mind. It's like, it's crazy how, like it's, maybe it's a little bit underestimated, like the importance of having a language that is pleasant to use, right? And I think this, <coughs> You can see an example of this in um, Elm, for example. So Elm is praised a lot for the very friendly compiler and, and very fl friendly error messages. And I mean, I'm glad that the languages are trying to catch up on this and are trying to uh, kind of make themselves really a pleasure to use and just fun to use and um, a fun experience and, and a experience that makes developers happy um, instead of focusing just on like performance or uh, make, make the language stable or add new features or this kind of stuff. So this was a really, really interesting um, result, I think. As far as the community and the ecosystem go, um, I think what we will see in the future, hopefully the first thing is that Elixir gets picked up by a big company or more big companies. So right now we're not sure that, our, that there are big Elixir companies. Um, using Elixir because they're not advertising it. There might be, but they're not advertising it. But getting picked up by a big company means a lot of things. It means that the language um, gains a lot of credibility because there's big companies using it. Um, it means that the language, that there's gonna be more people wanting to learn the language to work for big companies, right? So the language is just gonna naturally gain a lot um, if it gets picked up by um, big companies. So hopefully that will happen. Another thing that I think will happen is that the ecosystem will get larger and better. So we're seeing this happen already, where the number of libraries, for example, in Elixir has been increasing, right? We're having more and more libraries. Um, and the idea is that hopefully at some point we're going to close the gap that we have with languages like Ruby or um, JavaScript with Node, where you have a library for everything, right? And this has been historically a problem for Elixir because it lacked some libraries, lacked uh, some functionalities that some libraries that provided functionalities that other languages had. Um, and I think I'm really happy to see that the ecosystem is growing so that this, this gap is closed and, and there will be libraries for most things like in, like in Ruby or Node. Um, and um, I hope that the ecosystem will get better. I think it will get better as well. Um, and we're seeing this happen as well because if you have more... Holy shit, I'm going to trip before the end of the talk, 100%. <laughs> uh, but we're seeing this happen already where um, since libraries are more and more, 
to the number of libraries is increasing, the quality is increasing as well. Because now, for example, you have two libraries that do one thing, but one is focused on being friendly to developers and one is focused on speed, right? Or one does one thing one way that suits better your application and another one does a thing in another way that suits better other applications, right? So having more means that we're also going to get better quality libraries, we're going to get more specialized library, more focused library. So the quality of the ecosystem, I think, will generally increase by having more libraries that do things better. Um, so this, I'm 100% I, I sure that will happen, and I'm very excited to see, to see it happen. This is something that I, I'm speculating. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think this will happen, where we'll, uh, we will have less core contributors to the language and more contributors and maintainers for the ecosystem. So if you look at the this is the commit graph for the for Elixir's life. And again, commits are not a good way to measure things, but can, they can give you an idea. And you can see that after the peak of like Elixir development, 2011, 2012, 2013, that's kind of where, where the language starts to be stable, then the number of commits tends to go down, right? And that kind of seems like like it means to me that the language needs less work, right? And we're seeing this all the time. Like there's less bugs open for Elixir. There's less work that contributors can do to for Elixir directly for the language, right? And if you look back at the contributors graph this year, it might be it might be this might be the cause of why we have less contributors. It might be because there's just less to do in Elixir, right? And I didn't have time because these things take time, but I didn't have time to do a graph for like Act or Phoenix. But hopefully, like they would get or libraries in the ecosystem. But uh, my speculation is that people are contributing more to the ecosystem than they are to specifically Elixir itself, right? Um, and I think that this is really good because in ecosystems like Node, for example, or Ruby, there are people that are really, really committed to working on one library, right? So. I mean, I can can think of any examples, but there are. But in in the Ruby and Elixir, in in the Ruby and the Node community, for example, there's people that maintain one library. Or there's a team of people that maintains one one library, right? And we don't really have that because the only teams that we have are for huge libraries like Phoenix or Nerves or Ecto or Elixir, right? We don't have a team that maintains Redix, right? It's just one person. We don't have a team that maintains uh, Postgres because it's just one person, right? So and. I mean, I think that having less core contributors and more contributors to the ecosystem will mean that when someone wants to contribute to the language and they see that there's nothing to contribute to the language or the barrier is very, very high, I think that hopefully they will go to somewhere else in the ecosystem. So they will say, does Ecto need help instead? Or does this library that need help instead? Or like, I may help maintaining this library, for example. So hopefully, uh, I mean, I'm really, really excited to see that happen and really hopeful um, that it will happen. But it's speculation, so I'm not sure. Last question is, will Elixir survive? Right? <laughs> Who knows? Um, what does it mean to survive, first of all? I mean, will it survive foreseeable future? Will it be, will keep growing? Will it be, get picked up uh, by more and more companies? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, the first one thing that I can tell you is that there's right now there's not much relying on the Elixir team for doing things, which is good because the Elixir team is a small number of people that have a limited amount of time and resources. So, um, but the language is now in a place where it provides tools to let you do everything that you want, pretty much. So, a really really interesting thing that I want to share is that if you look at Elixir from 1.0 to now, and now we're at 1.7. One feature that was added to Elixir needed to be added in Elixir. Everything else could be added as a separate thing. And that one feature, you want to guess which feature it is? It's width. So the width construct was the only one, because it's a special form. And for, th for something related to variable bindings, it needed to be handled by the low level low of the language. right? But that's the only thing that needed to be in the language. If you take anything else, if you take like um, the formatter could have been done on top of the language, right? If you take things like gen stage, they were meant to be in the language, but then we realized that we, they didn't need to be in the language, right? So why put them in the language in the first place? And the same thing with stream data, the property-based testing library that I wrote, wrote for the language, we wrote it to be in the language because we wanted to have it in the language, but then we realized that we didn't have to touch any of the language in order to build it. So why put it in the language? Like we can 
put it as separate tools. And this is really empowering for the community because it means that they can do things themselves. They don't really need the team or the language to change for them to do stuff, right? Um, and it, this is an interesting graph that shows that shows that uh, Jose is still the biggest contributor in Elixir. Um, and it's interesting to see that like the core team is the, the smallest contributor to Elixir, like the rest of the core team. So most of the commits in the code base are still Jose. But I think that a lot of that comes from the early days, right? Because he did a lot of work on it. And commits are not, again, are not a really good measure. But um, I think that the idea is that the core team is not that um, necessary anymore for doing things. Like the language doesn't need to change for you to do things. So d the community wants deployment. They can do deployment themselves, right? They don't have to rely on us to do the work, which is really a good thing because it empowers everyone and in, it allows the language to keep living and keep growing without the help of the core team, right? So you as members of the community, what can you do to m improve the language and make sure it keeps evolving and make sure it keeps growing? Definitely contribute, and by contribute, I do not mean write Elixir core code. Uh, that's the last thing that we probably need. Like the most, the things that we need the most in the Elixir world are people that contribute to everything else, people that contribute to the ecosystem, to libraries, people that fix bugs in, li in libraries that are widely used in Elixir, or we need people that contribute to the community, that create community events, that create that start meetups. We need people that contribute with learning resources. So we need people to write books and to write blog posts and to write tutorials and to do all this kind of stuff that really make the um, ecosystem better and the whole environment better and thus making the language better as well. And if you really want to do important stuff in Elixir, like deployment is a pain point that we all have right now, right? Um, and nobody really, like it's hard to do anything about it and it's a very daunting task, it's a very big task. And so I understand that people might think, I would like to help with deployment, but I don't have the time, I don't have the, the resources or the knowledge to do this whole big project by myself, right? So the thing that I encourage you to do is start discussions. Like if you want to be part of the deployment discussion, just ping people and like try to be active in in trying to start discussion around this because the core team is always going to be working with Elixir and is always going to be helping the community with whatever project, big project the Elixir community needs, right? But if you just start discussion, you can you start discussions, at least you can get the things moving. So if you, for example, send proposals to the mailing list, so we're trying really hard now to to encourage people to send very well like detailed and very well done proposals to the to the mailing list. And like a really good proposal is like a lot of work implementing that is usually not the biggest part like the biggest part is writing a proposal um, so like, i encourage you to do that that kind of stuff um, and that's going to really help in making the language grow and making the language better and ultimately what i'm saying is that the elixir team is there we will try to do our best to keep the language alive and keep it thriving but really the language is in your hands right so we just like throwing the language in your hands, uh, in the hands of the community. We're hoping that um, that you will pick it up and you will make it thrive uh, and make it live for a long time. So that's it. <coughs>